know Christ, a television ministry of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. Here is your host, Rev. Jeff Peterson. Well, as we continue our series on sharing our faith, today the topic is, Adam, where are you? Now, when we think about parents and their children, normally, in a loving relationship, parents really care about their kids. And they really want to see their kids develop. They want to see their children grow up to succeed. And so they do everything that they can. They provide for them a nice home, lots of uh, nurturing, provide a good education. They help them to develop talents that they may have, whether they be athletic, musical, intellectual, uh, analytical talents, shop, outdoors, whatever it may be. But really, it's the parent's heart's desire to really just get behind their kids and to say that I'm here as your parents. To bring you to a level to where now you can succeed. And so that when you leave the nest, you can fly. I remember a parent once saying to me that as their child was, as his one child was getting ready to graduate, and he was a little choked up about it, as all of us are at this time when our children graduate and they start leaving the home, saying, well, as much as we love our child at home and, and life is so precious here, the day comes when they have to be able to fly out of the nest. And as hard as it is to see them fly out of the nest on the one hand, because we just always want them to be right there with us, that if they are not ready to fly out of the nest, then we haven't done our job. And on the one hand, we have loved life the way that it's been, having the child in a nest, but on the other hand, we now want them to be able to fly and soar, and we feel good about that. So God created everything, and it was good. And as we look at creation, we'd say, oh, isn't it good? I mean, tell me what part of creation you like. Or if you could go somewhere. I mean, a lot of times when we go on trips, it's going to see some aspect of God's creation that's really fabulous. Niagara Falls, the Grand Canyon, you know, to watch the waves crash on the ocean, or, or to go out to Colorado, Utah, or someplace like that, and to see the beautiful mountains. Or sometimes just sitting out back watching, watching the sun rise or the sun set, depending upon which way our backyard is facing. There's just so many beautiful things. And a lot of times we don't have to travel anywhere to see that, you know, all of creation is good. You know, to be able to see some a squirrel out on a bird or out on a squirrel feeder or a bird at the, at the hummingbird feeder, whatever it is, to say, isn't that just a remarkable thing about creation? And so God created everything good and God created Adam and Eve. God created Adam, I mean, that's his son. I'm so proud of you, son. I'm so proud of you, Adam. Then I'm going to do everything that I can to love you. I'm going to put you in a wonderful garden where you're going to feel like a, a trillionaire. I'm going to provide for you every opportunity that you can to succeed. And there's nothing more that I want from you than to see you. From, I want to see you succeed. And it's not just succeeding in life, but mainly succeeding in our relationship. I want this father and son relationship to be something very special. It's never been seen or done before, and, we, and hopefully nothing will ever compare to this. And that's what God wanted from Adam, is just this wonderful, special relationship. And then when Eve came into Adam's life, it's like, oh boy, I'm now gaining a real special daughter as well. Being somebody who just had a wedding not so long ago where my daughter was married, thinking, I've just gained a son-in-law. How wonderful. So what is the point that I'm making here is that 
God is about relationships. And that's what he wants from us more than anything. But there's a problem in paradise. And as we read in Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, we begin to see that you know, there's a story, and it's the story of fall. Now, a lot of times people say, well, this whole story about Adam and Eve and creation, and then the whole thing about the serpent coming into the paradise and tempting Adam and Eve. Is that all just, is that true, or is it a myth? <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> a couple of things here. Is it a myth today? Do you experience this story today? So if we were to say, well, it was just a myth. Well, it's not a myth today. It's, <laughs> it's reality. And there's nothing that explains our humanity better than this story. Now here again, I've studied psychology. I've studied religions. I've studied philosophy. I'm not trying to say that I'm all-knowing. But I've never come across any story that better explains our human nature than the one that's in the Bible. And so if you were to say, well, this is literally true, that it all happened this way, or this was some mythological story that the Holy Spirit to say, well, we need to put this in to show that this is humanity and our story, whatever you're coming from, the story is truth. Whether it's literal or figurative, it's the truth. Because it's the truth today. And as I read history from the previous generation, it was their truth. And the generation before that. And I've read through history all the way, you know, like through the, you know, the Middle Ages. And whenever humanity has existed, boy, this story seems to be front and center. And I've not come up with, I've not seen anything, any kind of a story that tells the truth about humanity like this one does. And so I'm just going to read a few verses from it. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good from evil. Okay, that would be Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. I mean, that's just one couple of verses. I mean, just chew on that. The serpent. It says, oh, God said that you shouldn't eat of any, you, know, you can eat of all the, the fruits of the, uh, of the trees, but not that one. Oh, come on. You know, this is really the tree. Because if you eat of it, your eyes are going to be open, and you're going to be just like God. You will be God. And you're going to know good from evil. And so Adam is kind of scratching his head, just saying, well, I want to be obedient to my father, but, hmm, <laughs> this is quite an offer. This is quite an offer, and it's an offer that I don't think that I can pass up on. Okay, well, we move along a little bit further into the story, and... This is where Adam did not pass up on the offer. And so I read uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, and this is after Adam ate from the forbidden tree. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called the man to the man, Where are you? Adam, where are you? It was like a parent's worst nightmare. That's the last thing that we want to hear. Something bad has happened to our child. I'm... Going to try to find, you know, Adam, hey, how's, how are things going? Eve, good to see you. But where are you? Normally you're right here. Well, they hid themselves. They, re they recognized that they were naked. Well, that was a knowledge that they weren't even aware of. They didn't even know that there was such a thing as nakedness. They were always exposed before God. 
But now they're trying to hide. They make fig leaves. They're hiding from God. So what kind of a relationship is this if we're hiding from each other? We don't want our kids hiding from us. We don't want to be hiding from each other. They're hiding out of fear, out of their disobedience, out of their shame, out of their saying, God, we don't need you in our lives anymore. We know what's right for us. We know what is good from what is evil. And I think that's a lot of times the argument when we have with children, as they get older, as they cut their apron spring, strings, that they are now, you know, thinking, well, yeah, you know, the old man and the old lady, yeah, well, they got it all right at their house, and, you know, things were okay when I was living there, but, you know, things are a lot greater now that I can be off on my own. I know, I, I know what's right for me. And so that's kind of the way that it is with our relationship with God. I don't need God. It's my life. I know, I know what I want. I know what's good for me. I don't need my parents or anybody. I don't even need God telling me what to do. Trust me, I'm fine on my own. I can make my own decisions now. I'm a big boy. And so that's the way it was with Adam. But yet the father is grieving, saying, Son, I miss you. Son, I am hurting. And so, however this is, however we rebel, and we can rebel in so many different ways, and we can hide behind our fig leaves and all of our knowledge and just say, you know, Mom and Dad, I don't need you. God, I don't need you. Pastor, I don't need you. I'm totally fine on my own. And I'll figure it out on my own. I can save myself. And so that's where God knows that, that Adam and Eve, yes, they are convinced that they know what's right from what's wrong now. They can live their own lives apart from me, but God knows that there's a problem. That Adam and Eve are not aware of themselves. And that's the thing about our humanity is that we are blind. We don't understand. Yeah, I know how to live my life. I don't need anybody telling me what to do. But that's where God is continually wanting to shine into our lives and help us to see the importance of being in relationship with him. Because he is the one who brings life. And as we read in uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse uh, 24... And this is after now there's been a curse placed upon humanity, placed upon Adam and Eve. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. In other words, the tree of life now, that's the source of life that they need. That's and so the tree of life is Jesus. It's the cross. The cross that is alive and vibrant. And as we receive the life of Jesus, that, that we come to life. That Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. But as soon as Adam and Eve fell to sin, God knew that it was at that time that he was going to have to come into this world and he's going to have to save his son. He's going to have to save humanity. As we read in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so Adam is lost, and so now it is God who is now looking to find Adam. Now I hear a lot of people say, well, I can come to my own confession you know, they'll say, I have found Jesus. I've now come to a place in my life where I've got the faith now to be baptized. Just like, no. We have to understand that we all are in the middle of a deep wilderness that is pitch black. Where we don't have a compass, a flashlight, or even a map to go by. 
If you take steps this way, you're going to fall off a cliff. If you step, take steps this way, you're going to uh, go into a rushing waterfalls. If you go this way, you're going to burn up. If you go backwards, you're going to freeze. In any case, well, we can go ahead and go diagonally. Well, no, you're not going to have any food. The only way that you're going to be saved is somebody coming into this wilderness and finding you. The wilderness of this life, it's a jungle. And it's Jesus who finds you. He's the light of the world. His light shines in our lives. And so as I <clears throat> uh, now look at all of this, I'd like to read from, from Romans uh, chapter 5, verses 15 through 19. And so I read. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace in the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned, through that one man, how much more will those who receive God, God's abundant provision of grace in the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. And so what is the Apostle Paul saying here? Is that Adam, he disobeyed. The one trespass, that one sin, where he ate from the forbidden tree. And sin came into Adam and Eve's life, and then through all the generations. And like I said, you know, I'm not here to argue about mythology or truth or what literally happened, what didn't. I mean, I believe literally that this story happened. But here again, if that's a problem for you, just read the paper today and to see, well, okay, uh, whether whatever happened, <laughs> you, know, you know, 300 generations ago, well, what's going on today in our generation well, certainly we see that this story is truth for today, don't we? And so now where is our hope? Well, that's what the Apostle Paul is saying, is that there is a new Adam, a new firstborn. His name is Jesus. And just as Adam was born without sin, but then the devil came in and tempted him, and he fell to that sin, well, now Jesus has come into this world, and he too is without sin, and the devil is tempting him all along the way. But Jesus never fell to the sin. And because he didn't fall to the sin, he is the righteous one. That he can now undo all of what Adam has done. And so that's what he does, is that he undoes what Adam has done. And what is that? He dies, that Jesus dies on a cross for us. And that his death on the cross is what now has paid the price for all of our sins. And so now we have a new beginning. That the original blessing has now come to be again. That we can now live in the covenant of our baptism. We can now live in relationship with God. And there's nothing that, you know, parents, that when things have gone, uh, when things have gone awry, there's nothing that a parent wants more than for the child uh, to come back. I know a pastor friend of mine. Oh, he's such a good pastor. <laughs> Just a man so full of God's inspiration, and he's done a, 
a bang-up job in the church, and I've known him from the time that we were college uh, classmates and seminary classmates. It's just been a beauty to watch how God has taken this man's life and has done so much wonderful work. I won't mention his name, but maybe you know somebody who is kind of like this, uh, somebody's story who is similar. But he, he shared his testimony, uh, saying that when he was young, he grew up in a pastor's home where his, par where his parents just loved him. They loved him, they watched over him, they spent the time nurturing him. He was a very good student in school, a standout athlete. He was so faithful in the church, being involved in the church, and and being part of the youth group, and on and on. Well, after he graduated from high school, he, he kind of moved in with some guys, thinking, well, he's at the age where he needs to move out of his house and to move. And so he, he got a place with some friends, and he was kind of going to the school, taking some classes. Well, as the story goes, he got involved in you know, in, in the rest of these young guys got involved in drugs, and the drugs took a heavy toll on, on their lives, where they were not doing well in school at all, and, and having all kinds of problems. And he was estranged now from his parents, and his parents just grieved his being gone. It's like, Adam, where are you? You know, just kind of that pain, that's the pain that God feels when we are not in his company when we have left the house, when we've left the church, so to speak. God, we don't need you. We know good from evil. I've got all my diplomas. Nobody needs to tell me what to do. I can make my own decisions. But the relationship is broken. Adam, where are you? And that was this boy, young man's cry, parents' cry, where are you? And they prayed for him, and they prayed for him. And in a long time after not seeing, seeing his parents, because he hasn't gone home, he needed something. And he was all drugged out, but he needed something at home. And he went into the house. His dad saw him, and his dad was so happy to see him. And this young man just kind of looked at him, just needing to get what he needed. His father, I mean, it was the first time he'd seen him in a long time. Just say, he just called his name. His name wasn't Adam, but I'm going to call him Adam. saying, Adam, so good to see you. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I just want you home with me. Just like that, Adam went out the door. His parents didn't see him again for a long, long time. Well, one day he got some marijuana, and he was smoking it, thinking that it was just marijuana, but it was laced with angel dust, which was this hallucinogenic drug. But as he was in the state, he was dreaming that all of a sudden, God was speaking to him. Jesus was speaking to him. And you could see where, it was on this day where Jesus was separating the sheep from the goats. The sheep were going into heaven, the goats were going to hell. And he was going back and forth. And it was God that was just speaking to him, saying, Adam, which way is it going to be here? You know, if you continue down this road, it won't be long, and you're going to be finding yourself in hell. But you have an opportunity to repent. He just felt God was speaking to him in that dream. That was the last time he touched drugs. He went home. He repented. And he got his life back on track. And boy, did he get his life back on track. He's been a real blessing to the church, a real blessing to hundreds, if not thousands, of people. Adam, where are you? Well, Adam is now back home. Why? Because Jesus went searching for him. And so I read from Luke chapter 15. Uh, verses 1 through 7. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathered around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, 
This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully brings it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the ninety-nine righteous ones who do not repent. And so we see that Jesus is like a shepherd who is on our trail. He's searching for us. As we can see that, yes, he's got a hundred sheep. One of them has gone astray. You think, well, what's the big deal? He got 99 in the pen. No, that's not all right with God. He wants 100%. And so he's going out and he died. He died for 100% of the people. And so he's searching for all 100% of his Adam and Eve population that they all may be at home with him. God does not want anybody left outside. And so that's where we share our faith. We are in the ministry. We proclaim the good news, understanding that the light of Jesus has shined into this world and salvation has come to us, that we may live in this covenant relationship that God has established with us in our baptisms. But we may always say, but isn't there somewhere along the line that we've got to show some kind of a commitment? Well, yes, we now live and walk by the Spirit of God. But in the covenant, knowing that God's house is always there, he always loves us. We can wander away, but the door is open to us, and we have to understand that. That God is saying, where are you, Adam? I want you back here with me, that God leaves the house searching for us to bring us home. That there is a homecoming. That yes, when we look at you know, Joshua and Moses and all these people as they established the covenant, that asking the people to respond in faith and say, no, we will be faithful to the covenant. Peter says, I'll be faithful to the covenant, but we can see where, well, that didn't happen. That God now goes out searching for us and bringing us back to know that God is the one who's established the house. God is the one who's established salvation. God is the one who loves us and brings us home, saying, this is where I want you to be. I want you to be in my house. I want you to sit at my table where you will partake and receive my victory feast. And it's here that you will learn and hear my instruction. That we may live day by day in the beauty of God's love and grace. You have been watching To Know Christ with Rev. Jeff Peterson, pastor of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. For a donation of $15 or more, you can receive a copy of Pastor Peterson's latest book, Prayer, A Practical Guide to Getting God's Direction. Thank you for watching, and tune in again next week for To Know Christ.